who among his many excellent qualities bears the distinction of being the world's most influential living neuroscientist. It was Friston who dug the deepest foundations for the theory I am about to elaborate. He is best known for reducing brain functions of all kinds to a basic physical necessity to minimize something called free energy. That concept is explained in Chapter 7, but for now... Let me just say that the theory that Friston and I have worked out joins with that project, so much so that you may as well call it the free energy theory of consciousness. That's what it is. The ultimate explanation for sentience is a puzzle so difficult it is nowadays referred to reverentially as the hard problem. Sometimes, once a puzzle is solved, both the question and its answer cease to be interesting. I will leave it to you to judge whether the ideas I set out here shed new light on the hard problem. Either way, I am confident they will help you to see yourself in a new light, and to that degree they should remain interesting until such time as they are superseded. After all, in a profound sense, you are your consciousness. It therefore seems reasonable to expect a theory of consciousness to explain the fundamentals of why you feel the way you do. It should explain why you are the way you are. Perhaps it should even clarify what you can do about it. That last topic admittedly transcends the intended scope of this audiobook, but it is not beyond the scope of the theory. My account of consciousness unites in a single story the elementary physics of life the most recent advances in both computational and affective neuroscience, and the subtleties of subjective experience that were traditionally explored by psychoanalysis. In other words, the light this theory sheds ought to be light you can use. It has been my life's work. Decades on, I am still asking myself how the world might have looked before there was anyone around to see it. Now, better educated, I imagine the dawn of life in one of those hydrothermal vents. The unicellular organisms that came into being there would surely not have been conscious, but their survival prospects would have been affected by their ambient surrounds. It is easy to imagine these simple organisms responding to the biological goodness of the energy of the sun. From there, it is a small step to imagine more complex creatures actively striving for such energy supplies, and eventually evolving a capacity to weigh the chances of success by alternative actions. Consciousness, in my view, arose from the experience of such organisms. Picture the heat of the day and the cold of the night from the perspective of those first living beings, the physiological values registering their diurnal experiences were the precursors of the first sunrise. Many philosophers and scientists still believe that sentience serves no physical purpose. My task in this audiobook is to persuade you of the plausibility of an alternative interpretation. This requires me to convince you that feelings are are part of nature, that they are not fundamentally different from other natural phenomena, and that they do something within the causal matrix of things. Consciousness, I will demonstrate, is about feeling, and feeling, in turn, is about how well or badly you are doing in life. Consciousness exists to help you do better. The hard problem of consciousness is said to be the biggest unsolved puzzle of contemporary neuroscience, if not all science. The solution proposed in this audiobook is a radical departure from conventional approaches. Since the cerebral cortex is the seat of intelligence, almost everybody thinks that it is also the seat of consciousness. I disagree. Consciousness is far more primitive than that. It arises from a part of the brain that humans share with fishes. This is the hidden spring of the title. Consciousness should not be confused with intelligence. It is perfectly possible to feel pain without any reflection as to...